This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Former President Trump making an unexpected detour from his Iowa campaign trail 1,000 miles away in Washington, D.C. He voluntarily showed up in court today as judges weighed his presidential immunity argument in the 2020 election case. NTD's Melina Weiskup reports from the D.C. courthouse. Former President Trump and Special Counsel Jack Smith are both eager to get answers in this federal 2020 election case. They want a court to rule as to the question as to whether or not the former president is immune from prosecution in this case. Trump appeared here at this federal courthouse here in Washington, D.C. earlier this morning without being required to do so. And this is interesting timing for the former president. It comes when all of his GOP challengers are currently making their last rounds in the state of Iowa to secure last minute support there. But his appearance here in D.C. instead shows that his campaign team sees this as an opportunity to shore up more support for the former president by painting him as a victim of a politicized justice system. The former president, after leaving this courtroom today, expressed optimism in the case and doubled down on his claim of innocence. And in a rare moment, he showed gratitude to the media for covering his case fairly. Watch this. I want to thank everybody for the fairness. We've been covered very fairly. A president has to have immunity. And the other thing is I did nothing wrong. We did nothing wrong. Trump's legal team argued before three judges today that Trump's actions after the 2020 election fell within his official duties as president and served within the national interest. Therefore, they cannot be prosecuted. However, prosecutors argue that his actions were unprecedented and have no legal protection. Here's a bit of that back and forth. Never before has there been allegations that a sitting president has, with private individuals and using the levers of power, sought to fundamentally subvert the Democratic Republic and the electoral system. What he is forecasting is a situation where the floodgates will be opened. We are in a situation where uh, we have the prosecution of the chief political opponent who's winning in every poll. Uh, uh now, as we await a decision here, it's important to note that whichever way the court rules, this case is still very likely to end up at the Supreme Court. And while Trump's trial was scheduled for March, this appeals process could delay it past that date and possibly beyond the 2024 presidential election. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. A surprise filing accuses the Fulton County D.A. and a special prosecutor of having an improper relationship. The two are handling former President Trump's Georgia election trial. The accusation comes from co-defendant Michael Roman, who seeks to have his indictment dismissed. The document alleges a romantic relationship between D.A. Fannie Willis and prosecutor Nathan Wade, who is a private attorney. It says Willis contracted Wade without the required approval by the county. The 127-page filing also alleges the pair profited significantly from this prosecution at the expense of taxpayers. The filing says Wade and the DA took lavish vacations and he paid for them using the Fulton County funds his law firm received. The DA authorizes his compensation according to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. A spokesperson for Willis told ABC News their office will respond to the allegations through appropriate court filings. Senator Bob Menendez taking to the Senate floor to declare his innocence today. Menendez allegedly took bribes and acted as a foreign agent for nations such as Egypt and Qatar. The sensationalized allegations are now creating a rising call for my resignation, despite my innocence, and before a single piece of evidence has even been introduced in a court of law. I have received nothing, absolutely nothing, from the government of Qatar or on behalf of the government of Qatar. Prosecutors allege Menendez conspired to act as an unregistered agent for Egypt, among other things. The senator is said to have accepted bribes in exchange for his influence in Congress. Prosecutors filed a third indictment against him last week. The New Jersey Democrat is facing conspiracy charges. That includes conspiracy to commit bribery, extortion and acting as a foreign agent. In October, Menendez pleaded not guilty to conspiring to act as an unregistered agent of Egypt. He also dismissed allegations that he accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars from a New Jersey businessman. 
Heavy snowstorms slamming areas in the central U.S., several tornadoes and high winds also ripping through parts of the southeast, causing property damage. And more are expected. NTD's Jason Blair has more. Winter storms covered parts of the central United States on Monday, affecting three states. It left roads, farmlands and vehicles blanketed in snow. In Iowa, snowplows were busy clearing the snow, while in neighboring Nebraska, cars drove slowly on snow-covered streets. Extensive areas in Oklahoma were also blanketed in snow. The National Weather Service said it expects the major storm to impact large portions of the central and southern plains, Midwest, south and eastern U.S. through the midweek. In the southeast, a tornado watch is in effect for southern Mississippi, Alabama, and the Florida Panhandle. Tuesday morning, 55-mile-per-hour winds and hail hit the Florida Panhandle in parts of Georgia and Alabama. A 106-mile-per-hour wind gust was recorded in Walton County, Florida. In Panama Beach, Florida, winds blew off parts of roofs and scattered debris. Jason Blair, NTD News. Extreme temperatures and snowstorms attempting to derail GOP candidates' campaign plans in Iowa. And new polls showing contrasting depictions of the race in New Hampshire. And today's White House correspondent Iris Tao brings us the latest from on the ground in Iowa. In the past 24 hours here in Des Moines, Iowa, we got about 9 to 11 inches of snow and that's impacting traveling not only for us who got stuck on our way back to Des Moines last night, but also is impacting presidential candidates in the Republican Party who are campaigning right here in Iowa a week before the Iowa caucus scheduled for next Monday, January 15th. Former President Trump's campaign had to cancel several events by his surrogates yesterday and today, including one tonight, which was was supposed to feature former U.S. Acting Attorney General Matt Whitaker. Meanwhile, Vivek Ramaswamy also had to cancel three of his seven events scheduled today in Iowa. And that's after he criticized Nikki Haley for canceling an event yesterday morning. Meanwhile, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is still set to participate at a Fox News town hall here in Des Moines later tonight. He's also set to participate in a debate with Nikki Haley tomorrow night here in Iowa. Meanwhile, as this is all happening, the temperature will plunge starting this Saturday and next Monday. It's going to be below zero degrees. So it's really remaining to be seen how the turnout will be for the Iowa caucus, despite pretty much all the presidential candidates, including Trump, Haley, DeSantis, and Ramaswamy, now trying to boast that their supporters are loyal and motivated enough that they will turn out to vote for them next Monday. But a big question mark here, given the freezing temperatures here. Meanwhile, in New Hampshire, the primary of which is also coming up in two weeks, two new polls released today are showing very different pictures about the race there, especially when it comes to former President Trump versus Nikki Haley. A new poll released this morning by CNN and the University of New Hampshire shows that Trump is leading Nikki Haley only by seven points, and that's down from the 22-point lead back in November. But another poll also released today by the Boston Globe shows that that Trump is leading Nikki Haley by 20 points. So two very two two very different pictures drawn here. Meanwhile, we're going to find out more about the race there as we get closer to the New Hampshire primary, which is coming up very soon as well. Back to you. The mystery illness that kept Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin out of the loop this week has been revealed. It turns out to be prostate cancer. The Pentagon spokesperson today saying that Austin is recovering and in good spirits. I can tell you that he is actively engaged in his duties, uh, as I highlighted, uh, and um, fully engaged. Uh, and so, you know, completely confident in that. And we'll obviously keep you updated in terms of his status in the hospital. According to Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, the secretary's cancer was discovered in early December and he underwent surgery later that month. Then on New Year's Day, Austin was once again admitted due to a urinary tract infection, which was a complication of the surgery. The Pentagon did not inform the public about the diagnosis, not even President Biden or his cabinet members, until this morning. The lack of transparency has fueled criticism among members of Congress, some of whom have called for Austin to step down. 
Joining us now to offer us his reactions from a military and national security perspective, we have Darren Gobb. Gobb is a retired lieutenant colonel and international military strategist. He served under Austin when Austin was a division commander in the Army. Darren Gobb, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks. Always good to join you. Now, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is facing backlash after he did not tell the public or the White House that he was hospitalized for two days. Now, that includes President Biden, who is the commander in chief. What is kind of the pushback here, especially from a national security perspective? How significant is this? Well, this is significant from, you know, and, and the message that it sends is that there's a lack of effective communication between some of the chief cabinet members and the White House and even within those departments. So uh, in the end, ultimately, what I would call this is a dereliction of duty, and it's a very simple duty. You tell the next person in line what's going on, then you put them in charge for the period of time that you're not able to do your job, and then you tell your boss as well. Those are two very simple things, and there are staff all over the Pentagon that could have taken care of this for him if he didn't do it himself. Now, he should have called Biden himself, of course. But uh, ultimately, what it comes down to is this, this gives people more reason to doubt the authenticity and honesty of many of the people within the Biden administration. And, uh, and I would just call it a dereliction of duty. Mm. And now Congressman Matt Rosendale, he's a Republican, is calling for Austin to be impeached. What's your take on that? Is that the right call? Oh, I fully support Matt Rosendale for doing this. And uh, he is actually my congressman. So I've made sure that he knows he has my support in doing this as a as a veteran, as someone who served under um, general or at the time, Major General Austin, when he was a division commander in the Army. And uh I think this this is the right call, and it's not just because of this. It's you know because of Afghanistan. It's because of the spy balloons. It's because of the you know, overseeing the the so-called vaccine mandates and all of it's done to the services and the the inability of majority of the services to meet their recruiting and retention goals. There's a reason why all this is happening, and it starts in the White House for sure. But right next to the White House, standing next to him, is Secretary Austin, and all this failure means he needs to be held accountable to account as well. And this is a great way to do it. Now, speaking of the Chinese spy balloon that flew across the states last year, and also the current tensions we're seeing around the world, whether in Ukraine, the Middle East, and now also tensions around Taiwan, potentially, what needs to be done to ensure that the Americans are confident in their leaders? Replace them. That would be the best answer with competent leadership that is willing and able to do their job and deal with both the good, the bad and the ugly. This is this is not a time for weak leadership, but unfortunately, it's what we have at multiple levels in Washington, D.C. And so if you're going to fix this, you start with leadership and you have to replace it. And it has to be done at many levels. And unfortunately, I, well, this is the year we're going to find out whether or not that needs to happen, whether, that, whether or not that will happen. Darren Gopp, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs> Welcome back. Israel Defense Forces are now expanding their operations in one particular city in the Gaza Strip. And the IDF says that while doing so, they've killed 40 terrorists in the last 24 hours. This comes as Secretary of State Antony Blinken wraps up his diplomatic tour in the Middle East. NTD's Jason Perry has the latest on the war and a warning this report contains footage that some viewers may find disturbing. On Tuesday, Israel Defense Forces released frontline footage of these troops trying to track down terrorists in this building. One of the soldiers comes out of a room, then a terrorist starts shooting at him through the wall. They exchange fire with the terrorist and take cover. Then the terrorist starts throwing grenades at them. The IDF later located two deceased terrorists at the bottom of the stairwell. On Tuesday, the IDF said they're now expanding their operations in Khan Yunus, and over the last 24 hours, they've killed 40 terrorists. Meanwhile, on the same day, Hamas released its own video, secretly watching these apparent Israeli soldiers patrolling the area until they stop near this truck. A terrorist then fires an explosive at him. 
but apparently he missed. As you can see, the smoke several meters away from where they were standing. And the Israeli soldiers can be seen running away from the area at the top of the screen as shots were fired at them. Hamas and other terrorist groups in the Gaza Strip still hold approximately 100 hostages. And it appears that some of their family members are losing patience as they blocked humanitarian aid from getting into the Gaza Strip. My son was kidnapped 95 days ago. He is uh, sick, he has a colitis disease, and his uh, stress uh, situation is getting severe. We are going to stop the trucks because it's supposed to be humanitarian for humanitarian. It can't be only one side. They get all the help. All the humanitarian, I, I, I'm uh, okay with that, okay? They need to get food, okay? But my father-in-law need also get medicines, get food, and we don't know anything about them. Meanwhile, Secretary of State Antony Blinken has been touring the Middle East during the last few days in an effort to prevent the war from expanding. On Tuesday, he said this in Tel Aviv. On this trip, I came to Israel after meeting with the leaders of Turkey, uh, Greece, Jordan, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia. All of those leaders share our concern about the spread of the conflict. All of them are committed to using their influence, using the ties that they have to prevent it from escalating, to deter new fronts from opening. Blinken's concerns about the war expanding comes as Israel Defense Forces conducted another airstrike in Lebanon and has now killed two commanders in the Hezbollah terrorist group in two days. Blinken added that the U.S. remains intensely focused on bringing all of the hostages home. Jason Perry, NTD News. Major unrest in Ecuador hours after a state of emergency was declared. There are reports of explosions, kidnappings of police officers, and incidents in prisons across the country. Armed men attacked a TV station during a live broadcast today. That's the footage you see here. The unrest was sparked when a notorious gang leader known as Fido recently vanished from prison. Ecuador's president ordered police and the military to set up roadblocks and start combing through streets and prisons to find him. And now violence is reportedly spreading to universities and this TV station. Gang members have also taken police officers hostage and firebombed police vehicles. Until recently, Ecuador saw less violence than neighboring South American counties. But now it's become a key point for drug trafficking to Europe and the U.S. Gangs in Ecuador assassinated a presidential candidate last year. Russia is detaining a U.S. citizen. Authorities arrested Robert Romanov Woodland on January 5th for various drug charges. A Moscow court today ordered that he remain in custody until March 5th. Authorities charged Woodland with attempted large-scale production and sale of illegal drugs. The charges carry a maximum of 20 years in prison. 32-year-old Woodland was born in Russia and adopted as a toddler by an American couple. He's been living in Russia since 2020 and working as an English teacher. Reports say he appears to be a U.S.-Russian dual citizen. Woodland has said in a previous interview with a Moscow newspaper that he considered himself to be only Russian and not American. Moscow is holding more U.S. nationals. They include Marine Corps veteran Paul Whelan and Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gerskovich. The State Department says both men are being wrongfully detained. Dr. Anthony Fauci in Congress for a second day of questioning. What should lawmakers be asking him? Joining us now to discuss, we have Dr. Scott Atlas, a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He served as an advisor on the White House Coronavirus Task Force in 2020. Dr. Scott Atlas, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Yeah, happy to be here. To begin, Dr. Anthony Fauci is facing his second day of questioning on Capitol Hill. That's over his role in the pandemic response. Now, you were actually part of the White House Coronavirus Task Force in 2020. What questions should be asked of Fauci? 
Sure. I mean, there are many questions, and I know the committee is asking about gain of function research and how his hand was complicit in funding Wuhan directly. But I think they should be asking more specific questions about the management of this pandemic. Number one, he should be a standard pandemic management, as outlined by Henderson in 2006, 15 years ago, was lockdowns do not work and lockdowns are extremely harmful. Did you not know the data or were you simply lying? Secondly, is it not unethical to shift the burden of a disease to the poor? Lockdowns did that to protect the affluent. Or don't you, Dr. Fauci, view ethics as part of your role? Three, it's proven lockdowns failed and harm millions. Do you not understand the data or is it simply that you will never admit you were grossly wrong? Four, all the data and studies show that masks do not protect the wearer or stop the spread. That was even known in the spring of 2020 for similar respiratory viruses. Why did you not correct the misinformation that you spout that masks are protective or prevent the spread? Do you not read the studies? Do you not understand the data? Or are you again lying to avoid admitting you were wrong? Five, what exact data did you use to say the six foot rule of separation? Other countries use three feet or four and a half feet. That rule of six feet destroyed certain businesses. Was it made up off the top of your head or was there actual data? Six, you recommended everyone should wear goggles in late July, 2020. That's not reported because it's so embarrassing. He stopped saying that even though it's the same pseudoscience that masks work. Why did you not? Keep saying it, Dr. Fauci. Is it just too embarrassing? Seven, why did you lie about the origin of COVID being definitely not from a lab back in early 2020 when literally it was impossible to know that? Eight, why did you praise China when it was blocking the transparency and inspection of labs by the World Health Organization? Nine, and this is very important. What exact royalties did you personally receive of the $325 million over the previous decade that NIH employees received, including partly yourself? What royalties did you personally receive from the private drug companies that you, the CDC, and the FDA were involved in evaluating and approving? And 10, why did you not immediately conduct large clinical trials on already approved drugs like hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin? These are known safe. They've been taken by billions of people all over the world for years. And they had a mechanism of action that implied they could work. Why was that discarded? Was it simply because Trump said those drugs might work? Again, one more, why did you say vaccines stop the spread of COVID when they are proven not to stop the spread after only a few weeks? And worse, why did you recommend experimental COVID vaccines with side, effect, side effects that are at best incompletely known for healthy children when healthy children have minuscule risk for serious illness? Is that not unethical? I could go on, but I think that's probably enough. Some important points you raised for sure. Now, the select subcommittee that is questioning Fauci has said that it uncovered, quote, drastic and systemic failures in America's public health system. Now, in your opinion, was that during the pandemic or before the pandemic, but revealed during the pandemic? Well, those, there were several failures during and before the pandemic. And in fact, what I like to say is that I think the pandemic exposed problems that were probably there before him, but we didn't know. Number one, there's gross incompetence in the public health leadership. And here I'm talking about Anthony Fauci and Deborah Birx, who ran the pandemic management under the Trump administration, and then Fauci ran it. In addition, the CDC leadership was grossly inept, denying basic science, confusing the public, issuing erratic guidelines. These things were probably there before, but we didn't realize it because this was the biggest healthcare emergency in probably the century. Uh, but secondly, there's a problem with the NIH funding, and this is very important for Congress to unwind. The NIH funds grants from all for all academic scientists in the United States who get promoted, who get university appointments promoted. You cannot get promoted without an NIH grant, and that's that kind of power influences everybody in academic science. It's, it needs the funding of, a, of grants and science in the United States needs to be decentralized because there was no chance 
that these scientists would speak out against NIH, like Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci's leadership during the pandemic. More so, 15 American university medical centers receive over $500 million a year, every year, from the NIH. You think that the universities are interested in, in jeopardizing that funding by speaking out? And expanding on that, doctor, what needs to be done so that trust in the U.S. public health system is restored? Well, there are several things that I've outlined uh, recently in a piece, uh, but one is first clean house of the leadership at the top, but also introduce term limits, not just for the people at the leadership of these agencies, but for the, even the middle management people. We cannot have people working in CDC, FDA, and NIH who know that they're going to be there long after a presidential administration. Secondly, we need transparency. We need these people full disclosure on royalty payments. This should be absolutely illegal, frankly, to have royalty payments to the people who approve the drug drugs in the government. This is outrageous, this conflict of interest. But we also need transparency on their meetings. These people work for the, pe for the public. They're not in charge of anything. They're employees. The public should be so seen, seeing their meeting discussions about these contentious and very difficult issues, like, for instance, the vaccinations in children, et cetera. Uh, you know, we need more transparency. That goes a long way. To, to doing things. And there are certain legislations, like for instance, we need limits on what a public health emergency is. That term is not either defined clearly, nor is it limited. And we had a president, President Biden, who invoked public health emergencies two years after the pandemic began. Uh, you know, that, that's not an emergency. And we should have had a, a much more thorough check on that kind of power. We're a free country. We're, we're not supposed to be mandated and lose all civil liberties, even during an emergency. Dr. Scott Atlas, thank you so much for your time. Okay, thanks for having me. NASA is postponing its plans to send humans to the moon now that the Peregrine lunar lander has failed to land. Why is the moon so valuable to America? NTD's Arlene Richards has more. NASA has announced it's postponing its planned Artemis 2 and 3 flights after the Peregrine lander failed to land on the moon. Artemis 2, which will send humans to orbit the moon, is delayed until September 2025. And Artemis 3, which will land humans on the lunar surface, is delayed until September 2026. This will be the first time humans travel to the moon since the Apollo 17 mission over a half century ago. And back out of the back to the center GFON then. Four, three, we have ignition. Hours after yesterday's liftoff, Astrobotics Peregrine lander, pictured here inside the rocket, suffered a critical loss of propellant. The original mission was to conduct experiments and scout the moon's surface. Its new mission? To see how far it travels before running out of power. Hopefully the uh, government process will be tolerant of these kind of failures and allow you know, future missions to go ahead based on what we've learned rather than just declare it a total failure and walk away. Jim Cantrell is a founding member of SpaceX, the CEO of Phantom Space Corporation and author of Breaking All the Rules, an inside story of the space race. He says it's important to land on the moon because of the moon's resources, a key one being helium-3. It's uh, probably the only source of clean fusion energy uh, that we have, and as we know, fusion is moving along. Uh, nicely in its technical development. And then secondly, it's the only substance that can be used to uh, run quantum computers. Helium-3 is a critical isotope rarely found on Earth. It could potentially be used for nuclear fusion energy technology, a theoretically clean, safe, and virtually limitless source of power. And it's also used to reach near absolute zero temperatures, which are required to power quantum computing. Quantum computers would be exponentially faster than today's computers. Reaching these technologies first would dramatically impact the U.S.-China power balance. There's multiple countries like the United States, China, Russia, the um, ESA, and India. You know, there's a lot of people going to the moon right now. Danielle Rusa is the granddaughter of astronaut Stuart Rusa, who orbited the moon during the Apollo 14 mission. Rusa says the competition is good for progress. 
one of Astrobotics' competitors, Intuitive Machines, is launching the Nova Sea lander to the moon this February, with the same mission of conducting experiments and scouting the surface. Arlene Richards, NTD News. A San Bernardino assemblyman has introduced a new bill in hopes of ending retail theft in California. NTD's Christina Corona has more details on the proposed legislation. Smash and grab robberies have increased throughout California, but there could soon be stiffer penalties for thieves who are caught and convicted. The bill known as AB 1772 seeks to impose harsher penalties on repeat retail theft offenders with convictions for two or more specified theft related offenses. Under the bill introduced by assembly member James Ramos, store thefts will no longer be processed as misdemeanors without jail time. Punishment could range from imprisonment in the county jail ranging from six months to three years. Assembly member Ramos said in a statement, shoplifting, smash and grab thefts and other acts of retail theft trends are causing retailers to close their businesses and endangering customers and employees. Since the pandemic, these crimes have increased. That is not the direction California needs to go. Ramos says public safety is a crucial concern when shopping and going into public areas. And you see all these retail thefts, um, these, these mobs coming in, it, it makes you worry about um, your older people um, going out shopping on their own. But not only that, it, it affects the workforce. The workforce of those that might look at their, for a job that's there, but knowing that this is in the back of their mind, not even going forward to apply for that job. So it's if AB 1772 is approved by the legislature and signed by Governor Gavin Newsom, it must also receive voter approval to become a law. Christina Corona, NTD News, El Monte. The march to the U.S. continues for a caravan of migrants. About 2,000 people resumed their journey yesterday through southern Mexico. This after failing to receive the documents they say the Mexican government promised them. The original caravan of about 6,000 migrants from Venezuela, Cuba and Central America set off on Christmas Eve with the goal of reaching the U.S. border. But after New Year's Day, they say the Mexican government convinced them to forego their march promising to give them some unspecified documents. The migrants were seeking transit or exit visas they hoped would allow them to take buses or trains to the U.S. border. But the papers they received do not allow them to leave the southern state of Chiapas, which sits along the Guatemalan border. William Penn's statue will remain standing in Philadelphia's Welcome Park. After mounting criticism from Republican politicians and others, the National Park Service withdrew its plans to take down the historical monument. The plan to remove the statue announced Friday involved expanding the telling of Philadelphia's Native American history and refurbishing the park. Penn founded Pennsylvania in 1681 after King Charles II granted him a charter for over 45,000 square miles of land. In a brief statement, park officials said that the plan was released prematurely and hadn't undergone a complete internal review. Democratic Governor Josh Shapiro took credit for the reversal, saying in a statement that his team had been in contact with the Biden administration to, quote, correct the decision. Welcome back, and now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, Michigan's national title win last night punctuated their perfect 15-0 season, at least on the field. Now, their coach was already suspended for that sign-stealing scandal. Do you think that will taint this title? You know, it's hard to think it won't because if the allegations are true, obviously it would have benefited their defense, you know, knowing what play was coming. And their defense was statistically the best in the country, too. On the other hand, the assistant coach that was at the center of the investigation resigned a couple months ago already before they had to play all these big teams. I mean, since this all came out, they beat Ohio State, Penn State, Alabama, and Washington four top 10 teams. I mean, surely they would have changed their play calls against Michigan, even with that assistant coach no longer there. Now, just to review, these allegations were that they had broken NCAA rules by scouting future opponents in person. That's against the rules because you could decipher the team's play calls on the sidelines in advance. Now, although head coach Jim Harbaugh was suspended for it, that was by the Big Ten, the NCAA's investigation is still ongoing. They would probably be in the best position to decide, you know, if it's tainted or not uh, and what action to take. So we'll just have to wait and see for what they come up with. 
Now, on that note, Jim Harbaugh has been answering questions about his future, like whether he'll leave for an NFL job. Now, do you think him winning a title would make him want to stay, though? You know, I go back and forth on this. Rarely does a coach leave right after winning a national title. I guess you mean Howard Schnellenberger 40 years ago with Miami. Uh, but, how, but Harbaugh, though, has had a number of head coaching jobs, so he does have that reputation. You know, he was in the, he was in the NFL before going to Michigan, led the Niners to a couple division titles, also led them to a Super Bowl appearance in just four years. Before that, he was back in the college ranks with San Diego and then Stanford, and he was successful at every stop, too. So I'm sure he gets offers all the time. I will point out, this has been his longest head coaching job now, nine years, and Michigan is his alma mater, so I'm sure there's some pull there. Sometimes winning a title, though, makes you feel like you've accomplished your job, too. In any case, I'm sure NFL teams would want him. I mean, he's one of the best at both levels. Well, now shifting gears to the NBA, Memphis announced that all-star guard John Morant will undergo season-ending surgery on his shoulder. How big of a loss is this for the Grizzlies? I mean, it's huge. He missed the first 25 games of the season because of a suspension. They went just 6-19 and without him. Then they go 6-3 and with him back, and now all of a sudden he's done for the season. Now, I'll grant they've had a number of injuries this year, so it's not just his absence. Uh, but they won the division each of the last two years, so this is looking like a lost season for them. Morant, he's just one of those players that can score, assist, rebound. He does everything well, and he's only six foot two. Really, no one I think is expecting his team to get back into the playoff race uh, with him sidelined. Well, now speaking of injuries, Pittsburgh Steelers linebacker T.J. Watt will miss Sunday's playoff game against Buffalo because of a knee injury. How do their chances look without him? You know, not too good. I mean, Watt was the league's defensive player of the year two seasons ago for Pittsburgh. And he might be in line for it again this year after leading the league in sacks. But if he, even if he was able to play, I mean, they wouldn't be expected to win. They just don't score enough points. Plus, they're on the road and they're playing at Buffalo, which is the hottest team in the league right now. They won five straight games. But they would especially need him against the Bills because their quarterback, Josh Allen, is so tough to bring down. He's six foot five, 240 pounds. I mean, that's pretty much a linebacker. Plus, he's as fast as one. Now, he does have a penchant for turnovers, but you've got to pressure him. Watt is the best in the league at pressuring. So it's tough news for Pittsburgh, and I'm afraid they're playoff hopes. Well, Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tiff. Shenyun Performing Arts wraps up their shows in San Francisco. A human rights activist praises the show for being the best promoter of the true soul of China. Francois Cavard, a human rights activist, and others were touched by Shen Yun Performing Arts in San Francisco. Worth watching very much, worth appreciating, enjoyable. All my respect and all my admiration, and uh, it hits in the soul. I love all the artistry because years ago I used to dance and I would know what it takes to be a perfection dancer and they are perfection they are simply perfect in all their steps everything is just so unique and beautiful audience members remarked that the live orchestra and patented backdrop caught their attention in addition to the dancers it's phenomenal i've never actually seen you know how they go onto the screen and it just kind of transforms you into a different magical world it's gorgeous the way you bend the classic art manners with the technique of the, of the screen back and everything. Breathtaking is one word, but there's vitality. Established in 2006, the New York-based company's mission is to revive genuine traditional culture. Many talked about the moral values and culture depicted on stage. It seemed there is a great deal of gentleness and respect for other peoples in the culture. The message that, um, you know, things, things are really difficult right now, very challenging. People are challenged in a lot of ways, emotionally, spiritually, and how we need to find our way again. It's the best, it's the best uh, promoter of the true China soul, what Chinese people are really made of. NTD News, California. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.